parent, 41 years old, by the name of Terence Terrell, was sentenced to seven years in jail. The girl, now a woman, she was 15 then, 23 now, has quietly received a settlement of $30,000 from the government as some kind of a settlement. But the ramifications of this story make one to wonder. But let me see, right off the bat, I've dealt with foster parents and foster homes in all my years as a reporter in Vancouver. We have the odd scandal, the odd, tr odd trouble. But when you consider that 55% of all the children in care are handled by human resources at a cost last year of $22 million, let me say, first of all, it's not an attack on the system. The vast majority of foster parents are excellent people. The fact remains, however, that this case calls for, and the review has already been done, the closest possible scrutiny, now and in the future, of foster homes. You can realize now while the department is considerably anxious to have police records checking of those who look after foster children. You're going to hear this story on this program this morning. Also on the program, We've got Chief Ron Derrickson of the West Bank Indian Band, who's going to tell us some of his ideas. He and other Indian bands are investors in the troubled Northland Bank. And Chief Derrickson has a plan by which the bank might well be taken over. In the studio this morning, too, I've got Professor Michael Goldberg from UBC, Professor of Commerce and Business, who's going to give us the score on the Chinese connection and how to get some money and jobs out of Pacific Rim trade. But first, after the break, the tragic story of the girl who fought for seven years to get some justice after the break. <laughs> You're now going to hear part of the story of this girl who at 15 was in this foster home. Eight years later got some measure of justice, or society did. She got $30,000 from MHR. The reason this is going on the air today is because the girl herself got in touch with the Webster Show because she wanted to tell her story. We considered it carefully and decided you were entitled to know. Here is part of reporter Mark Schneider's interview with the girl. They used bridal reins to whip me. It was the same way. They made me take off my clothes and bend over a bench. I could hardly sit down. The welts on my rear were about a quarter inch thick. The welts have long since disappeared, but the memories of the sexual tortures are as fresh as the day she gave this statement to an RCMP officer. Terry would wash between my legs. He would use dental on me between my legs. The dental was, would sting really bad. She's 23 now, but in 1977, at the age of 15, her worst offense was to be in love with a boy and sometimes spent the night away from home. For that, she was sent to a remote foster home in the Chilcotin. For four months, she endured almost every indignity imaginable and then spent the next eight years living with the horror of what had happened and trying to convince police and a series of social workers the nightmare was real. This year, her foster father, Terry Terrell, was convicted of gross indecencies on her and is serving a seven-year sentence. And MHR has given her $30,000 in an out-of-court settlement. This is her story. Terry told me he, they wanted to have fun with me. And if I went along with what they wanted to do, that it wouldn't be, that it wouldn't be as much fun as if I were to fight. He told me to go along with it. They tied my feet together and they threw a rope over the rafters and pulled me up feet first. So I hung upside down from the rafters. I was stripped naked at the time. Once I was upside down off the ground, flew out and got some snow and packed the snow inside of me. I hung for a little while and then Terry said I was getting a little too red in the face. They should take me down. 
I was hanging upside down for about three quarters of an hour. They let me down and tied me to the post. The rope went round and round. They got bored and left me alone. Linda was in almost every incident. In March, I came home for what was supposed to be a short visit until Terry and Jeannie came back. I kept telling Mom I didn't want to go back out there. I did the dishes and worked hard around the house, so they let me stay home then, and I didn't go back out to Terry's. About six weeks later, I pulled my dad aside and told him the story. I told him that I was scared to tell him and that I tried to keep it to myself and I couldn't. It was bothering me too much. I told him everything that I've told you. He said that what I was saying was very serious and it better be true. Dad told me that he would see what could be done about it. My dad said, asked me to tell my mom. Mom was shocked. She said she didn't know if what happened, if it was what happened to me or not, was true. She said, if I hadn't left home in the first place, this would never have happened to me. The trip was laid on me. Let's start again when you first got there. What did you think it was going to be like? Did you think that MHR had been there and checked this guy out so they knew what kind of person he was? Yeah, I didn't have any concerns. I wasn't worried about that sort of thing. I wasn't even on my mind. And when did things first start going so bad? The third day I was there. And what happened? Terry and Jeannie sat on the couch in the living room. And the two girls. These are foster children too? One was his daughter and one was a foster child. Stripped the clothes off me and an 11 year old boy sat on me and pinched my breasts until they were blue. And, he, and Terry was sitting there as this was happening? And his wife. And I was screaming to them to help me. And they just looked at each other and smiled. Did this 11 year old boy do it at Terry's instructions? I think so. They were talking before it, everything happened. Well, that was your third day there. Yes. Why didn't you get out? Where was I supposed to go? I was 40 miles out in the bush from Alexis Creek. And it was cold, and I didn't know which, which way to go. I was afraid. What time of year was this? November. Was it snowy outside? Not yet. But it was getting that time of year? Yes. Didn't, wasn't there anybody you could, could you phone? Could you call MHR? No, we had no phone. So when was the first opportunity to tell somebody? When I got out of there. At the end of four months? Yes. You had no other opportunity? No, I was too afraid. We Did you see your parents at any time during that four month period? Yeah, we came home a couple times. By yourself? No, Terry and Jeannie went into the house with me. Terry and his wife, Jeannie? Yes. Went with you into your parents' house? Yes. And did you tell your mother what was happening? No, they, I didn't have a chance. They were with me. When I went to the room to pack my clothes, Jeannie went with me. I had, I had no chance to say anything. They told me if I said anything, they'd kill me. And you believed them? Well, sure, why wouldn't I believe them? So you endured four months of this. Did not MHR send a social worker out there any time in that four month period? No. Not once? No. And when were you first able to tell somebody? You must have been just shouting it out by the time you got out of their clutches. No, I was too afraid. When I came home in the spring, it was only supposed to be for a short time. And then I was to go back. In the spring of 78? Yes. And I had gone down to Vancouver to be evaluated. I think that's why I went home at the Maples. It's a, a home for mixed up kids in Vancouver. Emotionally disturbed children? Yes. And what did they say about you? They said I was normal and that they felt Terry and Jeannie had done real good for me that I should go back out there. That's what the Maples said? 
Well, I found out this later, yeah. So the Maples, did you tell anybody at the Maples what had happened? No, I was too afraid. I thought I was going back out there. I was only going home for a few weeks. So when was the first time that you had an opportunity to tell somebody? I finally told my father. And what did six he do? I'm sorry, you're going to say six weeks? Six weeks after I had come home. And what did he do? I guess he spoke to Staff Sergeant Pence. At the Williams Lake Detachment? Yes. And what came of that? Nothing. I, they decided it was, it would be too much for me to go through court. I think my father was uh, afraid for me. Terry had phoned my father after I had been home for a while, and he said, I hear that Colleen's been talking. If you say anything, I'm going to spread it around the town that you've been fooling with your daughter since she's been three years old. Was that true? No, my father would never do anything like that to me. Tell me about your father. What kind of guy is he? A really good person. He tries his best at everything that he does, including being a father. But you must have been disappointed with him. A little. So you tried other social workers and nobody believed you? No, nobody would listen to me. I went to a, a St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver at one time after I had left home. I was living there. I went into the hospital and they put me in the outpatients program and they had me tell my story in a, in a group of people. They were all a bunch of old people and they all started crying when I started to talk. And I didn't need people crying for me. So I didn't go back. And it wasn't really until you got in touch with Rodney Hawkins, the legal aid lawyer in Williams Lake, eight years later that somebody finally did something for you. That's right. Tell me, Colleen, why is it important for you to tell me this story? What do you want to see happen? It's important to me because I don't think it should have happened in the first place. And I don't want it to happen again to somebody else. It's too late for me to change. But maybe not for somebody else. What should MHR do that they didn't do? Well, I think they should check out their foster parents a lot better than they do. And I think somebody should be responsible for making sure that all the foster kids get talked to away from the foster parents at least once a month for to make sure that everything's going the way it's supposed to be. And I hope the foster kids that are being abused aren't afraid to say something. Do you have any hope that things will change? I hope so, but maybe I'm just a dreamer, I don't know. From time to time, situations like this are uncovered, generally at the insistence of the offended party, 
And we in the media, media do our best to get at some of the facts. We're often accused of straight sensationalism. But unless you get the story across, there is very little prospect of enough public interest or enough government action to make sure that we finally take a very good look at what's happening for the protection of children. So here is report to Mark Schneider, who's going to fill us in on some of the... I have some questions for Mark Schneider, my reporter. Mark, can you give me more or less clinically or chronologically the number of times this girl, from the time she was 15 till last year, attempted to get a story out officially so that action could be taken? Well, as she said very clearly, six weeks after she got out, she talked to her father. Father went to Williams Lake RCMP detachment, and together they decided at that time that there probably wouldn't be the corroborating evidence to get a conviction. In other words, you had to have witnesses. Most of the witnesses were other foster children underage. They didn't think they could wrap mm -hmm. them up to do it. But from what I've been able to determine, Colleen at least approached people in authority at least 11 times before she found a legal aid lawyer in Williams Lake, Rodney Hawkins, who believed her. And this included school, school counselors, a whole series of social workers, uh, psychologists at St. Paul's, police officers. Everybody was touched by the story, but nothing happened. Well, you, can, you know the attitude is in these troubled days, here's another girl with another story, not capable of proof so let her just wander down the road. And I'm not saying they do that callously. There are many problems. Who was it that finally put a, that caused the investigation and the charges? Well, there were, I think, two people who were principally involved. One was a social worker from Williams Lake, Williams Lake who actually did believe her. And at the same time that he believed her, this is last fall, 1984, he went to the police and started a new investigation going. At the same time, Colleen went to the uh, Women's Resource Center in Williams Lake. They referred her to Rodney Hawkins. He listened to her for five minutes. He said, stop, don't say anything else. He called up an RCMP officer. He came down. He started listening and he said, stop, I don't want to hear any more. Come down tomorrow, give me a statement. And then from then on, it went like From then on, things. it went through, went, and don't forget, she had been 15 when this had happened. She was now 23, or pretty close to 23. There was a long and complex trial. That's right. Uh, he was, uh, Terrence Terrell was arrested in Maple Ridge in the spring of, of this year, went to trial in May. After a two-week trial, he was found guilty on two counts of gross indecencies, originally 16 counts of uh, various sexual assault charges. All of them could not proceed because it had to be done under the old sexual assault rules, which required much more corroborating uh, evidence than is required now. And wasn't he found guilty of At, some offense yes. involving marijuana? Yeah, possession of marijuana. Possession of marijuana. Now, um, what about this man, Terrell? How long had he run the Where was the home, to be specific? Uh, I have not been there, but I'm told that it's west of Alexis Creek, up a 40-mile dirt road right in the heart of Chilcote in a place called Handy Meadows. Now, interestingly enough, this was not Terrence Terrell's first crack at the ball, so to speak. Apparently, we have learned that Terrence Terrell operated a group home in Smithers in 1972. There was a complaint arising out of an incident at that time a young girl in his care had complained that she was forced to run naked as a punishment. Complaint was made, the group home was closed down, and somehow he's allowed to operate again, this time in Handy Meadows, five years later without that information having ever been passed on. Five now, years before. Do, I know that the MHR will have done a report. Did they put somebody specifically on to do the report? When Colleen went to uh, Rodney Hawkins, he contacted the ombudsman because he felt that there were procedural and policy matters that really had to be determined. How many people had Terrence Terrell in his care over the years? How long did he operate after this woman had actually complained? And MHR, through the ombudsman, at the ombudsman's request, dispatched a investigator, a David Stovald, to do an investigation. I am told that investigation is finished but that investigation has not been made public. So somewhere there is a Stovald report on this particular case? There is a Stovald report. And the ombudsman played a part in this, you tell me? Uh, Rodney Hawkins, the lawyer in Williams Lake, complained to the ombudsman that this went be far beyond just what happened to this young woman. 
that it involved perhaps as many as 35 children in his care. 35 kids who may have stories very similar to this woman's. Well, it's very obvious that there were major defects in the handling of this particular foster home over some considerable period of time. There's no doubt about that at all. So what can we expect from the government now? Well, it appears as a direct consequence of this one case, MHR is now reviewing the way that it reviews and accepts and approves foster homes. And I think what that will mean in the future is that all new foster parents, before they can become given children in their care, must go through on a voluntary basis a full police investigation. And of course, there's another aspect to that too. Much of the load of the care now by the government under its, we'll call it its reshaping program, is using many more non-profit societies on a contract basis. That's right. And the government, without problems within the government itself, will be able to say to these non-profit societies, you won't get money unless you have got police records checking for all your people. And new foster parents will be subject to the police checking too. But the current foster parents, that would be more difficult for them to do. Can you imagine going to someone and say, you have not got anything on your record, but we are going to investigate you now? I can't see that happening. Uh, I find that very tricky indeed, unless there's reasonable cause. In which case it would be a routine police in which case, investigation? In that particular case. Well, what have we done this morning? You've told the story of this girl. And the incredible thing that sticks in my mind is that the girl herself was so marked by this that from 1977, she tried and tried and tried and tried until 1984 to find someone who would believe her and investigate it. And it shows that, at least in the case of the foster home in the bush at Andy Meadows, there was, to say the least, a lack of supervision for a foster home away out in the bush. I don't know what else we can say on this this morning except that it is not denigration of all of foster homes in British Columbia. But I would suggest that the Stovald report should, at the right time, be tabled in the legislature with the MHR annual report. I don't blame the specific people in the department. They have a dreadful job to do. But when this kind of canker has been allowed to develop, Draconian steps, if necessary, must be taken to clean it up. Is that I an agree. exaggeration? No, I agree. Because it's so easy to get involved in one case and get terribly kind of head up about it. And I thank the girl who had the intestinal fortitude to say that after all these years, she wants to tell her story so that it can't happen to other children in the similar circumstances. That's my report on that this morning. Next, I'm going to interview Chief Ron Derrickson on the problems of the Northland Bank. Canadian taxpayers are not out of the woods yet over their banking problems. Up to now, we, the taxpayers of Canada, from our resources, have committed some $2.7 billion to the CCB, which is belly up, and to the Northland Bank, which is in trouble. Northland is a different story a bit from the CCB. Its assets were frozen, as I recall, by the federal government. When was that, Ron? I forget. September, September 1st. the 1st. Yeah. Now, Northland Bank is a little bit different from the other ones in that Chief Derrickson is going to tell you that it was the only bank in Canada that had a policy of handling native commercial business. Is that correct? That's right, Jack. A firm policy. Now, I'll, I've got to go off the top of this simply. Can the Northland Bank, in your opinion, be saved? We'll get your involvement in a moment. Well, I think it could be saved if the government took a very, very positive attitude. I mean, uh, as every day goes by now, it, it gets worse, and it, and it was bad to start with. I mean, the situation was bad that was created by government. I mean, the appointment of a curator, in my opinion, the curator has only the money he will make, and I mean, even with the instructions he got from the government, is, is in liquidation. That's where his profit lies. He's in a conflict of interest from the time he was appointed, by appointing Tush Ross. 
But in other words, but every receiver and or curator is in the same position. His, ass, his instructions are to save as much of the assets as he can, sell them at the best possible price for the benefit of the shareholders and the depositors, uh, etc. I, I agree only as, as far as uh, receivers are, are concerned, but you know, how many curators have they been in this country? I mean, two appointed since uh, 1932. You mean the curator is a slightly different job from receiver in bankruptcy? Or a well, under, bankruptcy. under the Bank Act, it's, a, it, it's vastly different. Uh, uh, the, the, basically, the, you know, my understanding, the curator was supposed to go in there, analyze what was there, see if the book was indeed uh, uh, there, with, whether the assets were truly there, whether, whether there was any horror stories hid. And, and, uh, but all the moves that the curator have been making since they've been appointed on September 1st have been aimed at liquidation. All right, next question. You were a director of the Northland Bank. For how long and are you still a director of the Northland Bank? No, I'm not a director anymore. Uh, I tendered my resignation uh, 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 several weeks ago uh, before this occurred. Uh, but uh, it was based on, uh, I'd made an offer for, for, uh, for a large portfolio of, of the doubtful loans of the bank, and, and because of that I had to offer my resignation. In other words, you would, you would then have been in a conflict of interest. That's right. How much money does the West Bank Indian Band, or any other Indian Band to your knowledge, have in the bank? Well, I, I don't know what the other Indian Band's deposits are. Uh, I understood there was some... Uh, Twenty million dollars in, in deposits from Indian people. Uh, uh, in the amount of money involved in shares of the bank, which is the money at risk, is well over four million dollars. And uh, do you have four million dollars of shares in the bank? No. You have how many? Uh, well, uh, let's say a couple of million in round figures. A little so, less than a couple of million. Well, you, you've got a considerable sum of money in as shareholders, and that, of course, will disappear if the bank is totally liquidated. Well, uh, I mean, it's, uh, I guess if you take the worst scenario, if, if the bank is liquidated, everybody feels that they'll lose because the shareholders are on the bottom, bottom of the list. But you have a plan to save the bank. What is your plan? Oh, first of all, is it worth saving? Oh, of course it's worth saving. Number one, the, the Northland Bank, and I want to make it very clear, is, is vastly different than the CCB scenario. You know, the CCB created their own demise. The Northland's uh, demise or, or, or problem was created basically by the CCB. Why? Well, uh, let me give you one example. When, when, when uh, uh, Edgar Kaiser uh, took over the Bank of BC, uh, uh, he, he pr uh, put a package together and, and, uh, to, to, and, you know, and the shareholders had to take a a little bit of a licking, and they brought in new capital and so forth. As soon as Edgar Kaiser did this for the bank of, uh, with the Bank of BC, and it was a good package, you know, and it worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 Mr. Neopold, the president of our bank, went to Ottawa and saw Mr. Kennett and wanted to do the same thing. Because, you know, the, the, the Northland at that time was having some funding problems. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Kennett's reply was, no, you can't do it because it'll pull down the CCB. Now, if we had been allowed to do the same things that the Bank of BC uh, had been allowed to do, the Northland Bank wouldn't be in the situation it is now. Did you, in fact, make an offer for, at a discount, of a large amount of the uh, bad loans with other people that uh, Northland had? My company, of which uh, uh, I have a partner, uh, uh, Mr. Dixon and myself, made an offer. Uh, 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 we own a company called Rondex Equity and Financial Corporation. And we made an offer to take over all the doubtful loans that the bank had. A and we pledged uh, Government of Canada, strip bonds, so to make sure that the entire amount of the loan was paid back. It's a fairly complicated deal. Yeah, but it was a discount. Let's say, let's say it was a... 150 million was it? No, it was 100 million. 100 million. And you would have bought those at a discount? No. We'd have paid full value on them. But you understand, they're, 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 uh, we pledged strip bonds, Government of Canada strip bonds, which would mature in 15 years. In other words, they'd get their 100 million back in 15 years. And meanwhile, you would try and collect on the loans? Yes, and plus we'd give them 50% of the profit, plus the, uh, all their first positions would be paid. 
In other words, and you say that the inspector of banks, while it was okay for the Bank of BC to do it, would not let the Northland Bank do it. That's right. And if they'd done that, you think the bank might still be in business today? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it doesn't just apply to the Northland. You know, there's kind of a domino no effect here. You know, we don't really know how, how, how the, the, you know, the business community is going to take this if the Northland is liquidated. You know, we, we, we can uh, take some guesses. We can look at the history of what's happened to other institutions. But some other institutions, a little bit in the shaky side, might be severely hit. Well, I, I mean, if, if you go back and you think that when they went to save the CCB, when the government said, we're not going to let any banks fail, it was a confidence, as you as an investor or the public as an investor, they retained that confidence that no matter where they bank, you know, that their, their money's going to be all right. Once they turn tail, you know, once they turn tail on the CCB and put it into liquidation, that confidence was gone. But maybe the government alone wasn't to blame for that. However, that's a complicated one. But next, I want you to tell me, Ron Derrickson, the plan you have announced, really, to take over the bank, right? Well, not to take over, to reorganize the bank. After the break. <laughs> Chief Ron Derrickson of the West Bank Indian Band, who has a plan to save the Northland Bank. Can you spell it out for me? Well, basically the plan was... First of all, do you think that... Uh, well, you'll hate me for this question. Do you think that the public is ready to accept a bank run by Native Indians? No. No, I, I don't think the public confidence would be there. And our plan is certainly not to have Indians have control of the Northland Bank. Just good participation in it. I think they should have participation equal to, to, to the amount of, of, uh, of funding that they're given from the bank. All right. Or more. Or more, okay. Now what's the plan? Well, the plan is basically, if, if, you, if you go back a couple of years when, the, when the, our famous liberals were in power, uh, 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 the cabinet approved a report to be done by, by, by Keith Penner. Mm -hmm. And it was an all-party report respecting Indian people. And, and, and it covered a whole facet of problems with Indian people. But in that report, the committee uh, 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 commissioned a, 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 a national chartered accounting service uh, uh, company to look at the trust monies that the federal government holds in trust for Indian people. That's the capital monies, which is about $1.3 billion at that time. They had found, you know, the accountants found that the government was unable to account for the money. They were unable to account for the money that they held in trust for Indian people. So, so the recommendation of the Penner report was the money be placed in, in chartered banks or trust companies. And, and uh, so using, and, and the Nielsen report, you know, the one that was leaked out and one of the... Caused Indian, all the trouble. Yeah, one of the... The Nielsen report also, which is this government's report, uh, also made the same recommendation that this money be moved into the, the, to, into the banks and placed as deposits so it could be accounted for. Well, because we know that once the curator was appointed for the Northland Bank, we know that if, if by chance a deal was put together and, and they unfroze the funds, I mean, the depositor, if you were a depositor, and if I was a depositor, which I am, we would move our money out right away. I, that's I wouldn't. That's what happened in CCB yeah. when the taxpayer put in that, his money that, through right. the Bank of Canada. And, and, and the American banks pulled their money out, and, right. and our big five banks pulled their money out. So, I mean, to, to, to take the curator out and unfreeze the funds now would be... Uh, would be disastrous. It would be a suicide for the bank. So, in other words... Those funds that are currently in there by the depositors have to be replaced. And we felt if the government put in the native trust monies, the capital accounts of Indian bands, into the bank, and if they were done in such a way that they were insured uh, by, by uh, a Canadian Deposit Insurance Corporation, then they would be fully protected. In other words, if there was 200 members of an Indian band, they could only put in... 200 times 60,000. Right. Okay. And then the money would be fully protected. There'd be no risk on behalf of the bands 
but it would also attack the Indians to put their deposits into that bank, seeing that the bank has a native lending policy anyways. Also, we felt that in the new restructured bank, it would have to have stronger Indian participation. Now, I'm not saying control. I'm saying minority participation in order to keep, you know, the confidence in the bank. And we felt that the government should put an immediate hundred million dollars out, the, 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 out of the Native Economic Development Program. Mm -hmm. And it's not a new idea. The Assembly of First Nations had set up a committee and allocated a hundred million dollars from the Native Economic Development Program for, for an Aboriginal bank, which they found would not work anyways because there would be, it would only be used by Indian people, right. so the funds would dry up very quickly. We also felt this $100 million should be, uh, should be put in as capital into the bank, and then the Indians, if they wanted to buy shares, they could, if the shares, say, were $10, uh, the, the government would match them dollar for dollar out of that $100 million. So they could have, in effect, raised $200 million. Right. And we also felt that the government should put up $250 million in government guarantees. Mm -hmm. So each loan amount for Native people would be guaranteed up to 50% of that amount. That would make sure the bank wasn't negligent in its loans because it had a full guarantee. Right. And, and that in itself would restructure the bank so that the bank had no risk. And it would cover all the current deposits. It would reestablish credibility and confidence in the bank. And using this vast, some of this $1.3 billion, which is lying somewhere in government accounts and trifle confused so that they can't properly account for it all, following the recommendation to be put in bank and trust companies. Would you not be taking too big a bite of that money, though, so that other Indian bands might resent the support of a Western bank with Indian participation at so much money out of the native trust funds? Well, that's the, you're supposing, number one, that it is a Western bank. It's head offices in the West, but it does have branches across the country. And, and remember, why would an Indian band resent it when no other bank will deal with them? I mean, it's the only game in town, Jack, and we want to protect the only game in town. What kind of reaction have you had from the inspector or from the government or from anybody? Well, we met with Barbara McDougall in Ottawa. She said that she liked it. Uh, she had some problems with the, with the native trust monies. Uh, she wanted to explore it more. Uh, and she would certainly keep the door open, but we've heard nothing, absolutely nothing. We have been unable to get any response at all. They might at least say thank you and buy your leave, and we don't like your idea. My feeling is that the decision was made bef well before the curator was appointed for the Northland Bank to liquidate it. My feeling is that if anybody comes into this, uh, if somebody is found to reorganize a bank, it's going to be the Royal Bank. You think the die is already cast? That's right. The deal has already been struck, in my personal opinion. And I, and I must stress my own personal opinion. You want to talk to Ron Derrickson about Indians and banks and Northland? Now's your chance. One segment after this break. <laughs> During the CCB uh, story, Somebody was complaining that the other banks were moving in and trying to whip away the accounts, which might have helped to keep it alive. Has the Northland suffered from this kind of invasion? Uh, yes, there's, there's been uh, complaints from customers of the Northland that they have been approached by, by other banks. And uh, as you know, when the curator was appointed, Tush Ross, uh, 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 the, the, the Royal Bank was hired as consultants to the curator, and they were in there reviewing the accounts. Uh -huh. It's a tricky situation. Now, if I'm a customer of the Northland at the moment, have you got deposits as well as investments in the bank? Yes. Can you get that out? No. no. Everything's frozen. Absolutely frozen. Can't even use it for collateral at another bank if you needed the money, you, you, can you? You cannot touch it. You can't touch the Are there money. many little people involved in it, in your knowledge, in the Northland? Well, there's lots of uh, little people. I, I, I was phoned this morning that there was going to be a big, uh, uh, there's going to be a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, there's going to be people picketing the bank this morning, the Northland Bank. I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard there, there's a bunch of people going to be picketing the bank in support of the bank. Oh, I know what you mean. Go ahead to Ron Derrickson. Good morning, Mr. Derrickson and Jack. Uh, I'm sorry, this is kind of off the 
Mark here, but uh, I, I was just wondering, since these are awfully big numbers Mr. Derrickson is putting forth about deposits, etc., and the majority of these monies have come from the small taxpayers in our society, I was wondering just how much money, uh, on a generous basis, Mr. Derrickson is willing to contribute to the savage unemployment situation we have in our society. Thank you. <laughs> That's hardly a relevant question. Did, he, you got lots did, of money? He, did he say the savage unemployment situation? <laughs> I don't think he meant that. No, 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 no. Don't be that sensitive. It crossed my mind too. He yeah. meant fierce. Oh, fierce. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I, I guess he said that with a lot of reservation, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, the West Bank Indian plan Band employs about 200 non-Indians. Ah. So, you know, we do, we do uh, contribute to the society. Sure, Sal. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning. I'd just like to say that possibly if the natives had uh, a bank of their own, what are you suggesting, that it would be a vehicle for them to do things for themselves as opposed to using the government all the time? Well, the problem is with a native bank, I mean, a bank relies on one thing, and that's deposits. And a simply a native bank on a scale to handle native problems nationally will not work with just native deposits because they are borrowers, you know, not depositors. Yeah. I mean, they're so far back on the economic scale that, that you know, they're, they're not in a position to be looking for banks to deposit their money generally. Hey, what about native loans by the Northland Bank? Were they in quite good shape when the bank was frozen? There is not one single bad loan to native people in. Not one bad loan, period, to Native people. Lots of bad loans, but none of them to Native people. Some bad loans, but none of them to Native people. Fair enough. Thanks. For, what, 200 people, how do you employ 200 people? Well, we own uh, the water slide. We have a construction <coughs> company. We're building a new office building in Kelowna right now for the band. It's a $2 million office building. And I can say one thing that the city in Kelowna and the regional district can't claim is that 100% of the materials and the labor was local. Good. Go ahead, please. What I can't understand is why we're always talking about saving banks. Why don't we talk about this business of the bad loans? To my re recollection, ba bank loans were always secured loans. What's happening to the whole banking policy system? Well, I think everybody got caught, especially in the West, it would seem, on the rise and fall of real estate prices and what might well now have been very unwise loans. Forget the big five and dome petroleums, but surely that's precisely what happened, the collapse of well, real estate equity. Well, look at dome petroleum. Where would the banks be right now if dome was allowed to go under? If the government allowed dome petroleum to go under, where would the big five banks be today? I shudder to think about it. Much obliged, sir. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Morning. Um, this is directed to Mr. Noel Derrickson about the NEDP program. Yeah. And I was wondering if this was the same program that it's called the 345 program. Well, to start with, my name is Ron Derrickson, not Noel. Noel's my brother. Uh, and what was the question? Is, the, is this the NEDP program? Is that the same as the 345 program? Yes. Uh, uh, it used to be called uh, the Western Initiative program and then. Uh, uh, we ca called it the Phantom Program for a while because even though the money was announced, nobody could uh, find where it was. Native Economic Development Policy Program. That yeah. was it, wasn't it? Yeah. $100 million. Uh, $345 million. But you wanted $100 million of that into the bank, did you not? That's right. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Hello. Oh, wrong one. Go ahead, please. Is it myself now? It is you, yes. All right, just a comment, Mr. Webster. First of all, if I had money and the bank would be competent, I would put it in regardless if they're native people or whatever. Now, that's where you're a hypocrite, in my opinion. What, me or Ron? Ron. Well, you, Mr. Webster, by doubting that the public would put money into a native-run bank. Oh, no, correct. I merely put that provocatively. If the bank is competent, you would put your money in. Right. Now, secondly, but Ron didn't take offense <laughs> at that remark. I think he was glad I asked the question. No, I, I made the point, not you, Jack, if you remember. And, and, and you know, I disagree. You know, th this gentleman, uh, maybe he has a pretty wide open mind. But I tell you, Jack, there's a lot of rednecks out there, you know, especially uh, in Alberta. BC's got its share. 
Fair enough, thank you. Go ahead from Kelo go ahead from Kelowna. Hello. Yep. I have two questions for Mr. Dirksen. Right. The first one is, uh, he and his partner in Calgary own a company and they owe the Northlands Bank ten million dollars. How come they didn't repay it? And the second one, as the director of the bank, why did you not check on some of these bad loans or check on the personnel making them? I'll hang up and wait for your answer. Well, number one, uh, uh, I don't owe the bank $10 million. You know, that's untrue. I'm involved in many companies, and these companies, and anybody in, uh, involved in companies. My, all my loans are in good standing. All the interest is paid. All the principal payments have been paid. Uh, uh, as far as uh, what was the other part of his question? I forget. Yeah. With $10 million, not yeah. untrue. Oh, uh, as far as the bad loans are concerned. Oh, yeah. Why didn't you Most of these bad loans that were in the that went into the Ron Dix deal w occurred before the present executive of the bank were there and before I was a director. What we're trying to do is work out from that recession of 81. Right, you haven't made that deal with the bank about taking oh, the Oh, that deal is, uh, is finished. That deal is, is made. And uh, so the, therefore you bought the loans at a discount with a guarantee? Uh, the loans weren't at a discount. That's very important to know. That the, you know, this was different than the Kaiser deal in such a way that the bank gets all its money back, plus it participates by getting 50% of the profit of anything that Ron Dix makes. Oh, I misunderstood you, you, misunderstood you earlier. I thought that was merely a proposal. No, that no is, that's, that's, a a sign, that's a signed and sealed agreement. With which you are well able to cope. Oh, definitely we're able to cope. Good. It's, it's a long-term agreement. Last call from Port Hardy. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Ron. I'm a friend of yours, John Walker. Give him hell. How do you do? Thank you. Is that all? That's the best wishes you could possibly have. Well, best of luck, and uh, if you take over the bank, maybe you can save the damn thing. Well, we're not trying to take over the bank. Let me make that clear. <laughs> I have no wish to become involved in banking. I don't even want to be chief anymore. I mean, this is my last term. You know, I'm not going to run after this term. I mean, I want to I wanna go and do some things while I still can. Best of luck with what you're trying to do to help save the Northland Bank. And I'll be back with Mike Goldberg on the Chinese Connection after the break. I was always told by my high-toned academic friends that to get ahead at the university you must publish or perish. Are you publishing this so that you don't perish, Michael I, Goldberg, Professor of Business and Commerce at the University of British Columbia? I certainly don't want to go extinct, Jack. But is it publish or perish? Uh, we, we have you guys got to publish books every now and again? We to like get... evidence of activity, and publishing is certainly a, a good measure that somebody's active. Well, this is certainly evidence of activity, you know that about that. Who printed it? University of British Columbia Press. Big business? 38 books this year. How much is that one? Dollar ninety-five. How much? Ten ninety-five. Ten ninety-five. That's cheap compared to other books. And Getting uh, plugged into Pacific Orem real estate trade and capital markets. Okay, let's come out with some of my misconceptions. Hong Kong Chinese already own ninety-nine percent of the city of Vancouver downtown and most of the areas capable of development around this part of the world. That's a good place to start. How wrong is it? Absolutely wrong. There was a survey that was done by one of the local real estate companies, and they showed that not a single Class A building was owned by anybody of Chinese origin. Most of the people who we say are Hong Kong Chinese are, in fact, Canadian citizens, and they've been Canadian citizens for a long time. The largest foreign owners in this city would clearly be the British and the Germans. Are they buying new stuff all the time? Uh, what they already don't own, they're buying new. Not the Americans? No. No, obviously not. But the British, all right. How do we plug in the Chinese connection? You know, I've had done programs about China with Paul Lin and other people, and they don't leave me filled with confidence that we're going to live off trade with China. Is there a Chinese connection that we should properly be developing? I, yes, and I think that's, that's uh, why I, I named the book that. I'm interested in, in overseas Chinese these are people who, of Chinese origin who live in Southeast Asia. And we have many overseas Chinese here, but of the world's 50 million overseas Chinese, 40 million live in Southeast Asia. They are the dominant economic group in the countries they live. 
As a friend of mine in Thailand told me, when you talk about Thai Chinese business, it's redundant. You only have to talk about Thai Chinese or Thai business. And in the Philippines and in Indonesia, it's the same. They are the dominant banking group, the dominant commercial group. And therefore, they're the key to the economy in those areas. And I think they represent an enormous opportunity for Canada to develop very close business ties with these people in these very rapidly developed countries in Southeast Asia. And we can enormously hedge our bets. I think it's very important that we not look to this free trade issue with the United States as a panacea. And one of my fears with free trade with the United States is we will say, well, we don't have to do any more work. We have the world's richest market at our doorstep. And now we sit back and we become totally vulnerable to the abrogation of a free trade treaty, which the Americans did 120 years ago. And I think to the extent we aggressively... Abrogation meaning cancellation. That's right. They got rid of it. They didn't like it. It didn't serve their purposes 120 years ago. And it was gone. It can happen again. And I think one of the reasons I wrote this was to try to interest people in becoming active in Southeast Asia. And Chinese entrepreneurs have an enormous network uh, very successful connections in Southeast Asia, and if we can get plugged into those, we have a broader base. You interviewed, uh, researched 80 major Chinese real estate investors all throughout Southeast Asia. Right. Did you find that they wanted contact with us or that little contact had been made with them? It depended enormously on, on the place. Um, people, uh, even in Thailand, which is the most self-sufficient of the, the Southeast Asian uh, Chinese communities, knew about Canada, had children in school in Canada, they had better ties with the United States. And they were all eager to develop ties with Canada. And they knew the difference between Canada and the United States. If I were a real estate man, should I be over there now flogging business with them? Only if you want to stay in that business for a very long time. The people in Southeast Asia found it revolting that people would come over and try to sell these very sophisticated people the residue properties that we had. I think is an enormous business, but it takes a long time to develop, and you have to make a commitment that you will be doing this for the next 20 years. You're not just in to take advantage of short-run gain, but you say, this is a place where we want to expand. Just as some firms have said they want to expand in the United States, then the commitment has to be made to set up shop there, learn local customs, perhaps even learn the language, learn the culture, and say, we're here and we're going to stay here until we develop a strong set of connections. <laughs> Has anybody business. done that yet in this particular field of expertise? There's one person here in town, uh, used to be Macaulay Nichols, now it's Colliers International, and John McLernan, who's the, the chairman, uh, has spent an enormous amount of time in the last decade developing those ties. Uh, some ethnic Chinese people like my friend David Lamb and Bob Lee also have these ties through relatives and through friends. But in all those instances, there's a clear realization that these people are not money grabbers. They're not here for the short run, that they are there to provide services to your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. And that's the key. That's interesting. So there's a vast field of development waiting there for a left West Coast Canadian businessman. That's right. You're not talking so much about trade as commerce. That's right. You're talking about real estate investments. You're talking about money for development here once you've established this solid lifetime base in but, any of these But countries. once those ties are made, these same people are the core of Southeast Asia's economy. And they are the people who are involved in textiles. They are the people who are involved right. in electronics. And once the connections are made, we can build on those connections for the general development of the Canadian economy. One question on free trade. Uh, Moroni is really basically philosophically committed totally against free trade. What was the famous election in 1911? Laurier and yeah, Morton. Right. Um, the Tories have always been totally against free trade. Do you really think the Americans would want wholesale free trade with us? Wouldn't that destroy yeah. this country? Our country? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it would be very destructive, and I, I think it has to be approached with great caution. There are unquestionably great gains from free trade. There are also great dangers. And the people who are suggesting that there are dangers are not just trying to protect their own narrow vested interests, jobs or whatever, but I think they also have some broader concerns. And the extent to which we have not had an ability to compete worldwide because of branch plants and a whole host of other things, I have no guarantee that's going to do anything but get worse in future. 
And more to the point, the thing that worries me most is we have not been known for aggressive entrepreneurship here in the past. To the extent we see a market supposedly there for the plucking, we're going to abandon all efforts to broaden our base of trade, and we will be even more vulnerable to American unilateral canceling of the treaty. So therefore, it's a good British Columbia, and all I want is free trade for lumber. <laughs> if you can get it. Which we can't. That's right. Mike, best of luck with your uh, Chinese connection. 1095. In local bookstores. And at the university. Of yes. Next, Webster and the Free For All. After the break. Well, I told you just about all I can tell you I, about the case of the foster home I had on this morning. I didn't feel it was appropriate to take telephone calls immediately after the program. Thought I'd give you time to think about it. But I haven't expressed myself at all on the political tragedy to John Fraser. Really tough. Really tough. No doubt about it. He made the wrong decision at the wrong time. And that the government ignored the PMO, it would seem, ignored the signals. They got a couple of messages, I think, when CTV was looking at the story. CBC, which eventually broke the story. And nobody thought to make quick investigations and find out what was happening. But it means that the career of uh, John Fraser is certainly for this parliament, I would imagine, over. I don't think in all my years I have seen such a clear confrontation between a prime minister and a cabinet minister leading to the cabinet minister uh, sending forward his resignation. However, free for all. I want to do more free for alls this year wakens me up and people like them. Go ahead, please. Hello. Good morning, Jack. Morning. I just wanted to say that I think the press has really got this wrong in regard to Jack Webb, in regard to John Fraser. Oh? I feel that, that he made the right decision, that nobody has ever proved that that food was inedible. It was unsightly, and his decision was right, and it was a deliberate attempt by Maroney's office to get John Fraser, not only his office, but the inspectors who were working for him because he overruled them. And John will be proved right in the long run on this issue. Well, on the face of it, you're looking on the very brightest side of it from Fraser's point of view. On the other hand, it would seem that he overruled his inspectors. There's also an allegation that he made the decision before the special counsel testing was done, that he responded to the job fears of Hatfield, and that they couldn't go to Ethiopia, somebody said. The, you, the armed forces refused it. And as such, if the armed forces refused it, how could you possibly sell it to the public? The easy decision for him to have been made, to made was just to say, get it off the shelves. But unfortunately, when the television people interviewed him, he stuck by his decision because John's a fairly stubborn man. He could still have corrected it, I would imagine, any time up to that day. Pity, I'm sorry about it. Really am. Thanks for your call. Go ahead, please. Hello. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Uh, a gentleman this morning um, accused you of being... Um, I think you've got your television sound up, my dear. Okay. Uh, accused you of being an hypocrite. I have to say that uh, no way you're an hypocrite. You're the best thing we've got on TV today as far as letting the general public know what's going on and speaking in our language and no fancy words. We know what you're talking about. And good luck and keep the good work going. That's very nice to get that call. Thank you, my dear. Super. Can I say Ibagum? Are you from Yorkshire? Uh, not far away. <laughs> where, are you where are you from? Lancashire. Lancashire. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, love. You're very welcome. Bye. I can't remember any Lancashire phrases except up for cup. Up for cup. No prizes if you know what up for cup means. I know what it means. I'm not going to tell you. Go ahead from Penticton. Yes, I would like to make a comment on the foster parents program, if I might. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you were speaking earlier, you were saying that um, foster parents that are presently foster parents would resent investigation. Now, my husband and I have been foster parents, and we feel that the reason that we are parents is for the care of the children and not our personal pride. Therefore, we would welcome any investigation by the police or the social worker 
social workers because we understand that it is for the children's best interest. And I would wonder about any foster parent that would not want an investigation. Well, no, perhaps I should, perhaps I didn't go quite far enough. I was speaking particularly about the facet involving fingerprinting and police records checking. Now, it's been very difficult for the government. They didn't think it was necessary up to now to insist, for instance, on fingerprinting and a clearance from the police department. Now, new foster parents on those societies who are handling children in care on a non-profit basis will, I'm quite sure, be required to be fingerprinted in future. But there is the question of fingerprinting those already running foster homes. Now, that's the one where I felt there'd be some resentment because as an old maxim, if somebody comes to you with a clean record and you're very cynical, you might say that merely means 20 years of undetected crime. Mm -hmm. No, it was just on the fingerprinting police record um, aspect that I was concerned thought there'd be resentment. Well, I, I, do st I think it's a very good idea. How often do you get inspected by a supervisor or a social worker in your foster home? Um... It depends on the age of the child. When we have a very young children, babies, it's usually not quite as, as often as when we have the teenagers. Yeah, because the young babies, uh, you know, a regular check will show if the baby's coming along nicely and in good condition. Mark, have you anything to add to this? Well, in this uh, guide to foster care put out by Ministry of Human Resources, they indicate that there will be an annual review of foster homes. I'm not certain whether that means there's only an annual re review, whether it can happen more, but that's what's specified right now. Well, as far as this case was concerned, 40 miles up the bush from somewhere, I would certainly think that the child should have, on that occasion, this girl was taken by a police car to within 20 miles of Handy Meadows. That's what she says. She and says that she was driven up this dirt road, long dirt road that even the RCMP say they have difficulty getting through at some times of the year. Took her 20 miles up this dirt road with an MHR worker, dropped at the side of the road where Terence Terrell was. Terence Terrell drives her the rest of the way into the farm. Well, the Stovall report may enunciate precisely what pre-checking that was done, or checking done between 77 and 84. I think that's part of it, and I think people are also looking forward to very firm recommendations on how this can be prevented from ever happening again. Thank you, foster parents. You notice how anxious I've been this morning not to damn all foster parents. Are you still there? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, love. Not okay. Tonight. Not bye bye. Not tonight. Not tonight. Go ahead, please. Oh, no. Take a break. Take a break. Don't go ahead. Hold on. Already I one phone call this morning accusing us of being purely salacious in this foster child program, eh? Well, I can tell you that when we looked at the interview with this woman, we realized that you could not put most of it on. I mean, it was very difficult. Some of the stuff that she said was just impossible to talk about on television. I don't know if I have to mention this or not. One of the charges was that she had been assaulted by having, quote, and I must use the words, oh, a beard bum licking. And the judge, who writes a very solid decision, didn't find him guilty of that, did he? No. Uh, he, well, you've got the decision for He you. said, well, I'm satisfied that the complainant now honestly believes that she was being sexually assaulted when giving a licking. Remember she told us about the what? Uh, well, the riding crop. Ride, bridle or something. Riding crop. They may have been harsh, but under all of the circumstances, I cannot say they were excessive or improper under the circumstances that they were administered. So in certain circumstances, you can give a 15-year-old foster child a bare ass licking. With and, impunity. Well, I'm found not guilty in the, in the circumstances. In, in the, the circumstances, circumstances with other children around. OK, go on. Four. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, Jack? Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Uh, this girl received uh, thirty thousand uh, dollars from the MHR. I, I was curious if uh, they've ever uh, made any kind of a payment to anyone for uh, you know for for any reason actually uh, of the, that that uh, large amount. We do not know the terms of this. I don't know of any previous payments. And all I can say to you properly and clinically is the MHR gave her $30,000, probably without prejudice. But 
You don't know if... No, I don't. And I ain't going to speculate. Okay. Thank you. I can say, though, that when she received this uh, award of $30,000, she this was... Amount of that this amount of $30,000. This amount of $30,000. It wasn't an award. It was an, an amount. amount. Mm -hmm. That she was told that what she should do is live off the money penuriously. That she should live off the money as if she were on welfare. They would take her welfare away from her, and they expected her to just do that with the money. That was what uh, the advice was. She decided not to do that, in fact, and um, has purchased a home. I can't say I blame her. But the regulation is quite safe. If you're in possession of cash, you don't qualify for right. welfare. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. I'd just like to congratulate you on your show about AIDS. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome. I found it very informative. And a lot of questions yet. I discovered the next day that we didn't ask, nor did we get answers for. And we shall tackle the subject after some reasonable time has passed again to fill in the blanks. Oh, that would be great. It's not an easy subject to tackle when you're an elderly gentleman such as I am. But I found that I did learn a lot of things that I didn't know about the disease before. So did I. It didn't make me any more confident about the prognosis for the future. Yeah. In fact, it's one of the great scourges against which we must all be alerted and informed. Right? Right. Thank you. OK. Eight. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. I uh, enjoyed your interviews with uh, Shirley McLean very much. Smashing. I wanted to make a comment about the John Fraser resignation. I agree with the gentleman who was on about three calls ago who said that um, uh, I think, well, I, I feel that he was had as well. I'm not sure exactly why, but I think he was really had. Uh, that's all I had to say. Good well, morning. yes, I, he probably was, but the p correct political decision to make in the face of his officials as studies was take him off the shelves. Yeah, take him off the shelf, but for what good? I mean, uh, to save face of the civil servants? Public confidence, especially when CTV was on their back, uh, W5, 50 state was on their back. Oh, he was he what really, in essence, he really was a scapegoat. Don't I you agree? Can't, I can't, even though John's, I've known John for a thousand years, good friend and all the rest of it, I can't say that. I don't know. He may have been to blame all the way. One must never let friendship interfere with judgments. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Morning. I'm a little disappointed in the manner the MHR case was handled and the way they compensated the young lady. Why couldn't they have helped her by rehabilitating her in a manner of education, psychiatric help? I'll let you hear from you now. Well, MHR has not said that it's responsible for what happened. In fact, they have given her $30,000 clean and without any prejudice. It means that they don't accept responsibility for what happened. It was just money, simply stated. Yeah, that's, but their, the, that's the extent of their responsibility, as they the, feel the, it. The woman has a good point. I'm glad this case has come to light in detail now, because it means that a very necessary review and much more stringent controls will have to be placed on all foster homes so that not once in a hundred times does this happen. I think the point, though, is that MHR can't really offer her any other help because then it would be admitting blame. Liability and whatnot. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Dad. Oh, good morning, ma'am. You've got 30 seconds. Okay, I'll make it quick. I'm calling from Fort St. John, and I would really like to see you do a program now that it's been almost a year since the WCB office was closed here on whether the board still thinks it's not economically feasible to have the office here anymore. That's a fair question. What has happened to the claims from Fort St. John since it was a year since it closed it down? And leave your number, ma'am. Give it to Jeanette. All right. Hold on, please, and I'll be back after the break. We're still in the process of shaping up tomorrow's program, but we've got a chap here on the Canadian Farm Survival Association. Might do a piece on the problems at the food bank. And we've got the postcard caper, which you'll have to wait and see. That's really quite funny. Well, my thanks to you for your kind attention, consideration, and interest in today's program. I'll be back tomorrow, 9 a.m., precisely. Mm -hmm.